as an actor, just like a professional person in sports, you need to constantly be practicing at your skill. And being able to do a table read gives us an opportunity to get into a character. It's like going to the playground. You get to play. <laughs> so it's fun. Plus, working with other actors through table reads, I've worked with actors that I had not had a chance to work with previously, get to know them through that and make connections. This is the Faith and Family Filmmakers Podcast, helping filmmakers who share a Christian worldview stay in touch, informed, and inspired. Quiet on set. Rolling. Your hosts, Jeffrey and Jacqueline Witt. Welcome to the Faith and Family Filmmakers Podcast. I'm Jeff. And I'm Jacqueline. And we're glad to be with you today. And our guest is actor Peggy Schott. Peggy Schott is a Texas-based actor originally from New Orleans. She's known for her lead role of Becky Travis in four seasons of the faith-based crime drama series Vindication and a hundred plus other acting credits. She has also worked in casting for a variety of projects and has produced shorts and music videos. Peggy is a regular volunteer at her local pregnancy center and an active member of St. James Parish and the Catholic Daughters. She has been married for 41 years, has three children, and five grandsons. Welcome to the podcast, Peggy. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to have you. It's been a while. We've been planning this. And of course, we're going to get into vindication in a few moments. But well, that's I did why take we a had look to at- wait because... We were like, well, we have to wait until this season comes out so that we can talk about it. (laughs) And I wish we could talk more about it, but it's not out yet, but soon, very soon. (laughs) Okay, okay. Well, we're going to talk anyways. We just won't necessarily get into as many details as we might have otherwise, but it's still going to be great. How did you get into acting in the very beginning? Was it something you always wanted to do? Well, as a young child, I always loved to perform. I'm, I'm one of six kids. I'm number four of six kids. And just was always performing, but it was in middle school. I got into theater at my school. Um, I was in Oliver. I was Nancy and Oliver. And then I was Eliza Doolittle and My Fair Lady in seventh and eighth grade. And then high school, I went to an all-girls school. But the all-boys school down the street had some really big musical theater productions that they would put on. And so I went down there and was in lots and lots of musicals in high school. That's actually where I met my husband. He was the light man, so I wasn't interested in him then. But we <laughs> met a few years later and ended up getting married uh, very young. But I think that there's lots of good things about that, too. But yeah, we met through musical theater. And then I got a degree in graphic design. I had my own graphic design company in Florida for years. We had a family. And I did not do acting for several decades, really. And then as my children got older and they were trying to figure out what they wanted to be when they grew up, mm-hmm. and I started thinking, well, what do I want to be right, when I grow yeah. up? <laughs> and, and I just, you know, I kept dreaming about and thinking about how much I really enjoyed being on stage. And then I went with a group of friends to see a play and oh, I, it just bit me. Mm. And I'm like, I've got to get back on stage. And so I did. And I was doing stage work, met someone who I was in a play with who was doing some film work and commercial work. And I even helped him, you know, planning an audition, a callback backstage during a show. And I'm like, that sounds interesting. You know, let's try that. Mm-hmm. And so I did. And I got involved. I did a lot of student films, started working as a background extra on different things that were going on. This was all in Austin. And then also started working for different casting directors. I was a casting intern on some really big projects. And then some of the students would ask me to do casting on their things because I knew a lot of the actors in the Austin area because I knew them from working with them on set, but also being in class together. You really get to know the other actors being in class together. So I did a lot of casting and just branched out from there. And how old were you when you started taking classes or is, am I not allowed to ask? Oh, <laughs> no, I'm happy to say it. For a while, I didn't, but I was in my mid-40s. Okay, so that's really great because yeah. I think that there are a lot of people who you know, they think that they've missed their time, that their window, you know, it's closed already. And so I love this. I love that you actually went back and you started to really dive into this in your 40s. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, you are never too old. I was talking to a group of actors recently and we're talking about the fact that there are certain roles that we just look forward to getting a chance to play that we're not old enough yet. (laughs) And there there are not many professions you can say that I'm not old enough to do that yet, but (laughs) things to look forward to. So... So have you continued with casting throughout the years, or is most of that kind of in that early stage that you're referring to? I have continued. In fact, I had gotten away from it for a while. 
I had done casting, background extras casting for a feature film called Friday's Child. They changed the name to um, Age Out. It was about a young man who aged out of the foster care system. Uh And I had done all of the background casting on that. And six years later, I got contacted by the producers of that film. They were doing another film and they said, Peggy, we want you to do the background casting. I said, oh, no, 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 I don't do that anymore. And I made recommendations for other people and they said, no, we want you. Mm -hmm. So I said, if I can have a partner... I would do it. And so I did. I brought on an extras casting partner and she and I did the film together. It is called The Long Game. It is out there right now and I definitely recommend it. And I'm so thankful. You know, God opens doors, Mm -hmm. you know, and I, the first time they asked me, I said, no, I don't do that. And I'm so thankful that I did. I'm thankful to be connected to that film because I think it has very good messages. Based on a true story, 1957 in Texas. um, Golf, right? Golf. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. High school golf team. So. Oh, Wow, yeah. And that's, we did yeah. see that recently. Something I'm constantly telling myself. It's like, okay, you have to just, when things happen, God could be just opening up a door. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. be open to things. Right. And even things when you say, no, 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 I will never do that again. And then he says, but I need you to. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. Dennis Quaid. Yes. And you mentioned Texas, but also a Mexican tie there with the Mexican students and golfers. Yes, yes. It was the first time that Latino students were allowed to play UIL sports in Texas. This was 1957. Mm -hmm. And they were not allowed to play on the golf course. They were caddies Mm -hmm. at the golf course, but not allowed to play on the golf course. So they made their Mm -hmm. own hole and practiced. And the first year they were allowed, they won the Texas State Championship. Yeah, yeah. It was was really inspirational. Yeah. It was Yeah. Yeah, the long game. It was very well done, definitely. So that was really cool, and that's a great project. Okay, how did you get involved with Vindication? Well, Vindication, I had been doing a lot of, as I said, smaller films, student films, and independent things in the Austin area. Really, there was no faith-based things that I knew of at all. But my husband and I really enjoyed going to small-town film festivals together. And so everything that I would do, we would have them submit to these little film festivals. And there's a festival in Fredericksburg, Texas, which I just love. It's called the Hill Country Film Festival. And I had a short film that was in that festival. And in fact, I was even nominated for Best Actress for that role, which I thought was really interesting because I don't speak at all in the whole film. (laughs) Interesting. (laughs) Cool. You must have done a really good job. (laughs) <laughs> it's one of those things that I'm so glad I did that film, but it's something that I can't let a lot of people see. But anyway, okay. uh, um, right. but there was another film that was there at that same festival that same year. And it was a short film called Vindication uh-huh. because Jared O'Flaherty, when he, he had a little extra money left in the budget at his church yep. and said, can I make a short film? And they said, yes. And he made a short film. It was a standalone short film, Vindication. And it got into a lot of film festivals, Christian film festivals and secular ones. And it just happened to be at this Secular Film Festival in Fredericksburg. I did not see his film. He did not see my film. Um, I was on a panel and he came to that panel and afterwards he came up to me and we met and he said, oh, well, you know, there's talk about turning my short film into a series. You know, if we do, would you be interested in something like that? And I'm like, yeah, like that's (laughs) going to happen. And I said, absolutely. You know, I gave him my contact information and it wasn't Oh, it wasn't for at least a year and a half. Mm-hmm. Didn't hear mm-hmm. anything. Mm-hmm. Didn't hear anything. And then suddenly got open that door. So which episode was your character introduced into? In episode three. Episode of three. Season one. Because he ended up getting a little more money and made one more short film. Yeah. So those yep. two short films became episode one and episode two mm-hmm. of Vindication. And then episode three is when you come into the home, you meet the wife. And I yes. play the wife of the lead detective meet his daughter and the family and get to know more about his life rather than just the the crimes he's trying to solve. And it still wasn't really a series at that point, if I'm correct. It was just kind of one more. Let's make one more for a little while. By episode three, it was decided to turn it into a series. Okay. But it all, as it typically does, it all comes down to financing, Uh you know, and they were able to raise enough money to make a few episodes. It's like, okay, it is a series. Yep. But we can only afford to do, I forget how many it was at first, maybe just two. Right. And then we got a little more. And so we came back and made a few more. And just as we went along, and I think that Jared has done such an amazing job mm-hmm. considering how choppy the process has been for him to be able to tie the storylines mm-hmm. together. And, right, yeah. and as an actor to have, you know, the character arcs and the different opportunities that I mm-hmm. have had, that he has given me, yeah. that Jared's given me, but mostly that God has given me the opportunity to be part of this and and tell stories and hopefully people will find some meaning in mm-hmm. in the character that I portray. Yeah. 
So just as a writer and appreciating what you were saying about Jared being able to have that through line, even though he had to kind of do bits at a time and for at least the first season, what I think is really great is from what I understand, season four gets into the backstories of some of these characters. You know, so as a writer, it's like, wow, when you get to take things that far that you get to bring in a lot of the depth of the history, which then makes the stories even more meaningful. So I'm really looking forward to season four. Definitely. And I will say that the way that things have worked out, I think has been very beneficial to the show because Jared listens to the feedback that he gets from the audience Mm. and audience members. So many people just really appreciated in season one. Each episode is pretty much a standalone. It's a particular crime. That crime is solved and it's all, you know, wrapped up with Mm -hmm. a bow. But people kept telling him, we want to know more about the characters. We want to know more about them as people. And so that gave them the opportunity to start, instead of just taking one one episode to wrap things up, having things that last longer. So season two and season three, even more so. And as an actor, that has been just absolutely fantastic for me. And plus, he also will collaborate with us. There have been times when he says, you know, what?" because he knows that as actors, especially actors who have been working, living within the same character mm-hmm. for so long, he'll ask me, what do you see Becky doing? Mm. You know, what are your ideas? And sometimes he'll say, no. Um, <laughs> but then other times he's like, okay, we'll see what we can do with that. He had asked me for some ideas. And I was the one who said, I want Becky to be doing some charitable work. And I had a friend who was working in a prison ministry. And I had used that as an example. And the prison ministry that she was part of is not the same kind of prison ministry that Becky ended up doing. Mm-hmm. But simply, you know, planting those little seeds and saying, you know, I would love to see her doing something like that. And Jared is open to it. And I appreciate that a lot. Mm. That's awesome. Do you have any other things from season four that you are allowed to share? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, goodness. Yeah. Well, what can I share? There's things I definitely can't share. (laughs) But just keep watching. Um, Becky is human. She's a Christian. She is a human We all have flaws and we all just try our best. And mostly we need to rely on God and those around us that we surround ourselves with Mm -hmm. to get us where we need to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Those are things we need to see in movies. Yeah. We appreciate that about Vindication. Yeah, Jared, he manages that so well as a writer and as a director to bring in those very difficult moments, you know, but he's so tasteful with how he does it. And yeah, we really appreciate that. Good, good. Of course, we don't know exactly when this interview that we're doing right now will air. But as we're speaking, I've noticed recently some Facebook activity from Jared saying, you know, soon we turn to a new chapter in Vindication. Uh, I'm expecting to hear a uh, announcement soon about the release, but that may have already happened by the time our listeners are listening to this. But he does say, and in more ways than you can imagine. Mm. Oh, yeah. As far as starting a new chapter. So <laughs> that's one of the neat things that we've seen with regards to the progression of the story, sometimes a new season changes things considerably from the previous season. Obviously tied through quite well, but it's uh, kind of intriguing. Yeah, new directions, new challenges, yeah. new characters, maybe. I don't know. I'm guessing, by the way. I don't have any <laughs> insights. <laughs> well, the, the poster is out there. So if you look at the okay. poster, you'll realize that there definitely are new characters. Oh. And my character typically is in the home. There's a lot of things that go on that I don't get to see. So I'm looking at the post going, ooh, I wonder who that is. Right, right. <laughs> so, yeah, I can't wait to see it all come together. And I was in on the table reads and I'm trying to remember things. But oh, okay. in a way, I don't want to remember because right. I want to be surprised to see it for yeah. the first time. Yeah, I was going to ask, do you get to read all of the episodes? Uh, historically, no. Only the episodes that I'm in. And I'm, I'm in most of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there were a few that my character was not in. But the pandemic also changed things and we started doing Zoom table reads, which was really nice because like I said, I'm not on set with a lot of the people who are in the show, Mm -hmm. but doing Zoom reads, I'm able to to hear them and and meet them that way. Right. Um, I love Zoom table reads. In fact, I've got one coming up next week I'm all excited about with Shelly Pano. I just listened to your interview with her a few days ago. So looking forward to that. Hi, indie producers. Listen, I get it. I know how hard it is to make a movie make money. That is why I have teamed up with Jacqueline Witt from Faith and Family Filmmakers Association to create a 12-month program to teach you everything I've learned along the way. I'm Alexandra Boylan. I have written and produced eight profitable films. My movies include Switch, The Greatest Inheritance, my newest film, Identity Crisis, Catching Faith, and the list goes on. 
All of my movies have been on Netflix, Hulu, on the shelves of Walmart, Tubi, Amazon, iTunes. Again, another list that goes on. So set yourself up for success and sign up today at FAFFassociation.com. You can also find it in the show notes here. And we'll see you soon. So I'm curious, actually, let's just talk about table reads for a moment. Um, you know, you were mentioning that you appreciate them. So being in a table read for a writer who's not already moving, like if it's not already in production, I'm curious how that brings value to you. I know as a writer, I love gathering actors together to read my scripts because it really brings it to life and it shows me what's working and sometimes maybe what needs to be rewritten or something like that. So there is a ton of value for me. Plus, I have used them as like a pitching tool and it's been a very valuable pitching tool for me. But I'm curious from an actor's perspective, what does that add for value to you? It is a tremendous value add. As an actor, just like a professional person in sports, you need to constantly be practicing at your skill. And being able to do a table read gives us an opportunity to get into a character without so much of a commitment to it, mm. as if you're performing it for real, but it's just a little chance to, it's like going to the playground. You get to play. <laughs> so it's fun. Plus, working with other actors through table reads, I've worked with actors that I had not had a chance to work with previously, get to know them through that and make connections. Mm. So it's good all around. I really love doing table reads. Anybody need me? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's fantastic. And now that we can do them via Zoom and you can be with people across the country and across the world. Right. It's, it's a good tool for writers and actors. Awesome. Yeah, we found that Jacqueline's gotten to organize quite a few table reads, including this one with Shelley that you're a part of coming up. And more and more, we're finding actors just really expressing appreciation and saying thank you for inviting me and others saying, how can I get in on them? And so we're actually yeah. moving forward with our organization in various ways to bring about more of them. So it's something that we'll be expanding. Well, y'all did one recently and I saw the pictures and I was so jealous. I was like, <laughs> oh, I wish I could have been in on that one. Uh, yeah. Write a role for me because yeah. I enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. All right. So we actually are nearing the end of this portion of our first interview. And I've really enjoyed getting to know you and your background. And I love the fact that you started in your 40s. I'm just still not quite over that because I think that I have spoken to some people recently that have been asking, like, is it too late for me? And I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> no. no. So this is proof, you guys. This is proof. No excuses. So as we finish this out, I want to give you the floor and I want to give you an opportunity to share something that is on your heart that you would want to share with the film community, maybe actors specifically, or maybe just however you want to share. Oh, boy, there's a lot. But I suppose I'll speak to what you were saying about starting out later in life. Um, I find in so many ways it's beneficial to having been in classes. And that's the first thing I would recommend to people. Uh, if you're looking to get into the industry, take classes. Several I would recommend. Uh, T.C. Stalling has an online thing called Uncompromised Christian Actor. Highly recommend that. Uh, Tina Gallo has in-person and online classes. Uh, Kirk Waller. There are lots of good inspiration to people who are looking to get into the Christian film world. But most importantly is it's okay to say no. Mm. And it's actually important to say no. And I did not know that for quite a while with the things I was doing. I so much wanted to, to play, as I say, mm -hmm. go to the playground and be involved in things. And looking back, you know, I've always had my own code of what I will and will not do. But as I'm working more in the Christian film world and realizing there's more out there for me, but we're limited in what is available for us as Christians. But it's okay. And find your tribe like the Powerhouse Sisterhood mm -hmm. is a group of Christian actresses. And we support each other. And when someone has to turn something down, we all understand. It's mm -hmm. hard to turn things down, but we know that we serve a higher purpose. So find your people and be uncompromised. Mm, I love it. So good. That's good. Thank you. We look forward to talking with you more in the second half of our interview and getting into some, maybe some deeper information about acting. And I want to learn about, I know we talked when we were at content in September, we started talking about a short film. And so I want to kind of talk about that and get into some of the volunteer work that you do at the Pregnancy Center. Mm -hmm. I would love to. Thanks for listening to the Faith and Family Filmmakers Podcast. 
If you would like email reminders about newly released episodes and more, please sign up at faffpodcast.com slash email. That's faffpodcast.com slash email. Bringing filmmakers together for faith and family. That's a wrap.